Um, I'm going to run through um, what we really do at Durham, what our collections are, what our team, uh, who our team consists of, and then talk about the different ways that we integrate archaeological skills into our sessions and some hopes for the future. So um, at the University of Durham, we actually work across multiple sites as a learning team. So we have Palace Green Library and Archives, and that's all the archive and special collections. We have the Botanic Gardens. We have the Oriental Museum, which has a fantastic Egyptian collection, also Chinese, Japanese, Indian. We have uh, Durham Castle, and we also have a lot of other library sites. And the team really does work across all of them. So you can see that the collections we have are quite diverse, which means our opportunities are diverse. The I should say as well that the team it consists of a huge range of uh, backgrounds. So we obviously have a lot of history people, archaeology, but we also have foreign languages uh, and we have an artist as well. So we, we all bring something and I think we really play to our strengths. And you, I'm a bioarchaeologist and I think that will become evident as I talk about some of the things that we do. So our approach is um, one of inspiring children. Um, it's inquiry-based learning, which we think is really important. The children asking questions and trying to find those answers. Uh, it's collections-based as well, so we don't teach anything that we can't bring back to our own collections. We use our own objects, we use our own archives in order to inform our sessions. So our standard sessions, um, we do a huge range. Um, we obviously do some outside work. We go and explore Durham Castle when we're doing that. For our Tudor Trail, we integrate a town trail around Durham. Um, anyone who's been to Durham will be familiar with, with this city. And it's one of those fantastic cities. It's got such a long history. And yes, the shop fronts change. But if you look up, you can trace that history through buildings back hundreds of years. So we look for the Tudor elements that are still there with the children. Uh, we do outreach as well as in-house, I should also say, um, and the sessions are very uh, similar, but we sometimes do gallery trails in-house and we um, exchange that for a different kind of session when we go out. Uh, in our standard sessions, we have a huge um, opportunity to really get archaeological skills. I will use the example of um, our handling our artifact sessions. This is just a small collection of um, some that we use for our Roman session. Again, when we do handling, we don't present the objects and give the children the answers. What we do is encourage them to find the answers by working together. Um, they have generally have an object between two of them, and we give them some questions that they need to ask of those objects. We also ask them to uh, measure the objects this is our opportunity to explain the importance of interpreting objects and the importance of that to our understanding of history um, and archaeology. So we ask them to record it as an archaeologist would. So they have to measure it. They have to look at the material that it's made out of. They have to um, use descriptive words to explain how it looks. Uh, and then we ask them a question and they ask the question of the objects what do you think it is and what do you think it was used for and what does this tell us about the people that used it and of course that's what really archaeology comes down to is asking those kind of questions of what we can see in the landscape of objects so it's really about learning that skill and at the end we do give them the answers um, but we encourage them to tell us first um, what they think and we certainly encourage them it doesn't really matter if they get the answer wrong because we don't consider it to necessarily be wrong in that manner as long as they can tell us why they think or why they've come up with that interpretation that's honing those skills now with prehistory coming onto the curriculum this has given us even greater opportunity to um, explore this and explore kind of object-based learning and inquiry-based learning. So again, this is a small collection. We use real and replica um, of what we use for prehistory. Um, it gives us the opportunity to talk about the limitations of, of objects as well. Um, and I think prehistory, again, is fantastic because 
because you don't have um, those written records for the vast majority of, um, of prehistory, you really um, have to work with what, what you have in front of you. And although we can say this was used for this, that remains an interpretation, which is great for kids, I think, because their answers may well be correct. You know, we, for some things, we're not entirely sure how they were exactly used. That gives children this fantastic opportunity to, to really explore their ideas. And again, as long as they can explain why they think that, they're effectively working as an archaeologist. What I've put down the bottom here as well is um, a timeline. We made a timeline that starts some of our history sessions, which is great for sparking this understanding of chronology. So we start here. I have brought one with me, but I needed to see how long I spoke for to see if I had time to roll it out. We start with modern day and we take the children back through history <coughs> to the point at which they're learning about. And this one is based on British history. And then we can look at what happened before and what after to try and give an understanding of how far back in time we're really talking about. We also did one for prehistory. One of the key differences in the history one is we have very set cutoff points for each, um, each period of time. For prehistory, I was eager to make that less defined because it's not so clear cut. They are obviously different scales as well, so they're, they're difficult to use together, but there's not many situations where we do do that. I, of course, had to just give up a little bit with Paleolithic, put a strip here, and usually I calculate um, what the nearest recognisable town or village is to the school that I'm working with, and um, to give a real sense of how far back you'd have to go if I created a timeline with the, the Paleolithic on it. Another session um, that we would do within prehistory is, um, I think it's a good example of, uh, it, it's, we create, we get the children to create Iron Age coins using metal embossing. But before they start creating it, we get them to work as tribal groups effectively and create an identity for themselves. Their task is then to try and express that identity through the creation of this coin. So, because that's effectively what we're working with. And again, that allows us to talk about the opportunities and the limitations of um, inferring things about past peoples from um, objects. Again, in prehistory, we have um, a little more time to look at some specialist areas of archaeology. So I jumped at the chance, obviously, of putting in a bone session. So we do a burial session uh, with the children. So we talk about, uh, we lay out a skeleton as a starting point, uh, talk a little bit about the bones, and then we really discuss what you can learn from the bones. Because, you know, what better evidence to learn about past people than through the past people themselves, this primary evidence. So uh, we do a burial activity, we explore the different things, and really I'm teaching them some things I didn't learn until master's level. But depending on the way that you do it, they can really walk away with some knowledge. We get them, uh, when we talk about uh, male and female, we get them to touch certain points on their skull and we talk about how it will change as they grow up. I have, however, learnt to best phrase the question about why female pelvises are different to males. <laughs> because the answers I've had <laughs> have been interesting. One was uh, because women can do the splits. <laughs> Um, I've had because ladies like dancing um, and possibly the worst one I ever had is because and I don't know how they connected it in their brain was because women do the cleaning <laughs> <laughs> now that young man learnt more lessons <laughs> that day than just what he came for so um, we've also we, when we go out in schools we've done this with um, yeah we sometimes get asked for science sessions. So again, I get straight in there and I'm like, we can do a bioarchaeology session. And we've done that with very small children and we've created um, things such as the pasta skeletons where they're thinking about the shape of bones um, and using the correct type of pasta um, to, to create their skeletons. With slightly older ones where we've extracted DNA from uh, strawberries, which is a good, uh, an interesting activity. 
Um, and we've done it with uh, year nines. They, they often do a lot of science sessions. Um, and we've looked at, we've got some casts of um, kind of weapon trauma of disease, and we can talk about that as well with them. <coughs> now, being at the University of Durham, we obviously have a really good archaeology department, um, and it's where I did my master's and PhD. So I've maintained my links with the department, and I created um, an exhibition with my old PhD tutor, actually, um, Professor Charlotte Roberts, which some of you may be familiar with her. Um, so we did skeleton science as an exhibition, but we also created a teacher's resource pack, which is available to download. What I did with that, I was very keen to make this usable for all teachers. So I went through the entire curriculum <clears throat> from key stage one, and then I went right up to A level. And I was looking at how I could create this, how I could make this useful for, for all of those levels. So you work your way through with very, um, with activities for younger ones, starting with very simple things, all the way through to more information on um, PCR and plague, all things that link back to health, to archaeology, but that can be found in the curriculum. So I think that's a good example um, of us working together collaboratively to create something that's useful for teachers across all of the curriculum. We have some other projects coming up. Um, I'm going to be working with the North of England Civic Trust and the Coquit Dale uh, Community Archaeology Group up in Northumberland. Um, there's something called the Border Roads Project. It's very North Northumberland. It's going to be a lot of driving. Uh, but we're going to take children out onto sites to look at the archaeology in their area and also do some classroom work with handling artefacts. Um, I think this will be a fantastic opportunity for those students. A lot of them are in small rural schools and a lot of them are linking it directly back to, uh, to what they're teaching. So I think it will be a great experience for them and it will be good for us because what we don't have in Durham, of course, when we're teaching is you know, we're, not, we're not on archaeological sites per se, so we're doing a lot of gallery-based learning. Um, so this will be great to be able to mix the two a little bit more. What I'm hoping to do in the future is continue to work on this. I would love to create a prehistory festival and make use of our botanic gardens. I haven't had really chance to get going with this because I need to find funding because obviously I want to make sure that we get craftspeople in and, and I need to pay them appropriately and it's financially what I could charge you know, for the children <laughs> versus what I need to pay craftspeople doesn't quite fit as a self-sustaining event. So I need to uh, research the possibility of funding for that. We do do teacher CPD events, um, and I'd like to work on this and do um, a bit more archaeology focused and prehistory focused as well, because I don't think all teachers are still fully um, confident about teaching prehistory. Um, so I'm going to work on that. New sessions, what, what I haven't really done, apart from the specialist bioarchaeology sessions, I haven't really advertised a session for schools that is archaeology. We integrate all of those skills into what we teach for the history curriculum. But I think, um, like I said in that, um, when we do the handling and we get them to do that inquiry-based activity, what you're actually covering in, in one sheet is mathematics, in English, we're encouraging them to use descriptive words, writing in full sentences. Science, we're talking about materials. Art, we're getting them to sketch the object. And history, we're getting them to ask those questions. I think we can expand on that and perhaps um, work a little bit with teachers to see if we could get children to come out and do a day of archaeology, which is actually for the teachers ticking a, lo a lot of maths and English boxes as well. Um, and online resources, we do have online resources, but I think we can perhaps do a little bit more that's archaeology focused. So there's huge potential. Um, if you want to know what we're up to, feel free to follow us on Twitter. We do post quite a lot. Um, there's huge potential to use archaeology, um, to teach archaeology and link it with the curriculum. I think we perhaps need to be confident about what we can offer teachers, we need to market it well, 
and we need to we need to just go for it really which is why i think i need to explore more focus sessions again but we really do integrate an awful lot and a bit like um was it brian said about stealth maths i think <laughs> that's the kind of thing they're learning way more than they even realize they're learning across the curriculum so yeah huge potential um and i did bring the timeline i suspect we don't have a lot of time <laughs> have we got two minutes yeah. we can do it do you want to see the timeline <laughs> yeah i might need a few people it's 10 meters <laughs> um in fact if you stand over here if you look at it at a different angle as well it actually is quite good for strategic <laughs> I tell you, that was a lot easier than when I get pissed to do it <laughs> it's a bit longer so yeah it's quite long <laughs> Um, we thank you. We do also um, obviously there is a huge amount of stuff going on in history down here. But I think what it helps to get the point across of as well is that over time you're getting this information recorded in different ways. If you think about the world that we live in now down here, every tiny detail of everything is recorded in some way or another and the further back in time you go we have slightly or we have less sources to consult so there's a lot of learning that can be done from just this timeline and of course depending on the age that you're working with you can pick out different historical events that they would recognize and get back to um, the bit that you're you're teaching them about so yeah, um, whoever's speaking next, I'm really sorry because I'm going to spend it rolling this back up. <laughs> but um, this actually wasn't, it wasn't actually that expensive to create either. We got two printed, Woodhorn um, Archives printed it for us and bless them, it took them about a day <laughs> to, to print this out. Um, and they did a prehistory as well. But I think it's a really useful tool, especially when we do outreach. Um, because we can take them into a hall and we can roll it out there as well. So there you go. Okay.